um, of the past. It doesn't matter that we're talking about this conversation and everyone leaves here with this right understanding of what, you know, um, what this is about and what we can do. I don't think that on the whole it's very easy to change things. Will small, minor changes happen? I think so. But I'm not sure significant changes can happen, but maybe I'm a pessimist. Well, in terms of Perhaps what strikes me most, hence I repeated, is the dumb 
how irrelevant this is to many reviewers, however. That this is a novel that insists on valuing the lives of crazy black faggots, or poor homeless black gay men. The force with which these figures are removed from the reviews is as startling as it is predictable. And something was explained to me why all none of the reviews basically ever mentioned that this is an 800-page novel about poor, black, <coughs> gay men and the lives they lived. Somehow that was the one thing that reviewer after reviewer just <coughs> mentioned, whether they liked it or disliked it. So there you go. Now that's what happens sometimes when the other is you, or in this case, when the other is me. I uh, wonder how many of us have had <coughs> essentially reviewed and uh, our lives and our depiction of our community called political. You know, uh, decried for its political uh, nature just by the virtue of representing uh, immigrant Latinos or African Americans or I, I, just, I just let me just throw out that's interesting about this review, as that most of the other reviews, some of them were by black people, some of them were by white people, some of them were by gay people, some of them were by straight people, most of them were by white straight people. Um, this review is by a black African critic who worked in, the, in a faculty in the university in this country, and shortly after he wrote this review, um, left the country because he decided he wanted to go back to uh, Nigeria and be a black activist for gay rights. <coughs> you know, that sort of dovetails into part of the description of, of the panel was to, you know, sort of talk about authenticity. And when I was reading the description, I was struck by the fact that there's the there's the sense from default from from sort of default reading of things of uh, whether we're authentic in the sense that we fit whatever stereotype or whatever tropes are familiar. But there's also the sense of, um, that I've experienced it, of um, the way we ask ourselves within our communities whether we're authentic, if our experience is authentic enough. And that seems to me um, really sometimes based on class and based on education, I wonder if you'd be interested in talking about, about authenticity within, within the community and without. What are, so one of the things, I have this story, if God is watching, um, that is sort of a magical look at 1919 race riots in Chicago. And the, the actual website it's on, it's on Rebellion Magazine published it. There's no comments, actually, but of course, the internet being the internet, sooner or later, somebody creates one just so they can talk about that thing they read. And one of the things that struck me when I was reading, I know you're not supposed to read, but you did, <laughs> was the number of people who just could not reason out that my, my main character and her brother moved north, her brother is <coughs> gay, he's not totally out to her, but it's not really a secret. And I've mentioned drag balls, which were big in Chicago at the time, and some other historical references. And they were convinced that black people would not be okay with drag balls. They were so convinced that this was a major gaping historical flaw that they apparently spent quite a bit of time digging around to prove that there was no such thing in Chicago in the, in the teens and twenties. They were wrong. Battle <laughs> <laughs> history. Don't, don't try to check me on Chicago history. I, I, it's a thing. But what was fascinating was that they were almost upset to discover that the narrative that they created for themselves about black people and, and homosexuality and, and, and any of this really wasn't real. And they were so angry about it that they could not get past the fact of oh, here's this fact to, okay, well now I've learned a thing they were stuck in. But this, I didn't even know about it. Where did she put this? How do you know? Well, it's a fact. It's, we didn't, homosexuality wasn't admitted in the last five years. And so I'm reading this thread, they're going back and forth about the kind of portrayals, and they've brought up some other things I've written. Because I broke lesbian steampunk with Clockwork Fairies. Don't. And 
that's a reference. There's some slavery references to that in that. And, you know, well, she usually has these gratuitous, violent scenes with, with sexual assault. I don't know why she does that. And it's like, well, because the history of black women in America is going to include that. We're going to have this authentic conversation that meet the ugly parts, too, and the parts, the normal way parts that come out. But that's one of the things, right? In that um, a lot of times when I write things, I never call them the supernatural elements that are absolutely not going to happen, right? You know, nobody is going to go around flying or having magical powers. Those things just don't happen. But I get called on the real thing. Well, my God, did that black woman actually think that she could fight this man back? Why is she doing this? Why is she, you know, behaving in a way that I don't believe that she should behave in? So they'll challenge in a lot of ways. You know, you'll be challenged on, you know, the aspects of that are part of my life. You know, the aspects that are me. But then there's no way they want to begin to challenge the supernatural parts of that we all know that it's real. Well, you know, if you start challenging mammy narratives or you start challenging, I can challenge mammy narratives a lot. Right. I, I, have, I have actual mammy issues. I'm just going to say this. I, I, I'm going to acknowledge. I mammy know. wasn't real. She didn't think you were special, smart, important, kind, any of that. Right. Let that shit go. But it turns up a lot, whether it's the actual mammy character or it's the black best friend who's mammy but not mammy, right? But she does all the same caretaking things and has no inner social life. And you will find folks who are also very attached to that. Well, how can you say that's Mandy? It's not like she's got a head scarf on. Well, we're attached. I mean, we're very attached to what we see on television and what we see in the media. And our representations are terrifically limited. I mean, you would think that every Latino is urban to begin with. And, um, and we're all dealing drugs, you know. We <laughs> beat me out back, you know. I got this stuff. Um, so, I mean, and I, and I think that we get challenged when we create characters that don't fit into that, when we create rural Latinos, when we create Latino, you know, uh, PhDs, because of course we also don't get quoted in the news. I mean, I'll, I'll fault my own uh, day job, really, for that. I think what's interesting about the conversation so far is, and it's kind of where I was hoping we would head, because I had some issues with the description of the panel, even though, even though I had interested in it. Um, <laughs> is that what is really interesting about alterity, about otherness, about, is not so much the representations we make of our own community, because we know who we are in some ways. We're making them sometimes for a broader readership, and that's fair enough. But what's really interesting is that alterity gives you an outsider's view of things. And that's tremendously valuable. Because the problem for me is not so much how do we, like, I, I, I speak to my own political experience as a gay man, how the gay movement has developed over the years into an increasingly assimilationist movement, like, let's all get married. Well, hold on, there's a lot that's wrong with the institution of marriage. Why aren't we challenging it? Like, where's that conversation going, for example? I think there is value to alterity, cultural and political value to it. And it gives you a perspective on things that lets you see what's wrong with the machine right out there, right? We are the fish who know we're wet. We're not the fish who don't know we're wet, right? <laughs> but, like, we know that machine's wrong. So why is it, I'll speak again to my own political work, why is it that if we just want to get our relationships, the special privileges, the folks relationships have, instead of saying, nobody should get special privileges based on their relationship status. That's a problem. Right? And so this is what I found valuable about alterity is exactly that distance we can and we can create representations, not necessarily just of us, although there's important work to be done in doing that. Clearly, let's not forget that. But we can make incredibly interesting representations of all of that as we see it a little more clearly. Right? And I think there's value, real value. I would I would strongly agree with that because uh, people sometimes who are not in uh, minority categories often wonder about the uses of you know, diversity and the big buzzword. Uh, what's, uh, you know, is it, does it just mean be nice to other people? Well, of course we should be nice to other people. Yeah. But, but particularly speculative fiction uh, loses its power, loses its potency if it does not acknowledge something that should be essential to it, which is a recognition and respect for alterity. And uh, I, think, I think that really is the bottom line, which is why people of every color and sexual orientation and race and everything should be in this room, 
yeah. because it's of interest, vital interest to the genre. But you know, we, it brings up questions of language. We all speak about it in different ways, and, and, and some of us speak to it in several languages at once. And um, there isn't, should there be a cohesion in language that we use in it? And what does that do in terms of uh, eliminating nuance that okay. comes from it? So I have to push, push about this language thing, because one of the things that comes up a lot, you know, I'm on Twitter a lot, I'm one of those people that does the hashtag thing, salaries for white women and, and fixing Chicago and these kind of conversations. And in those conversations, a lot of times, I am using African American vernacular English. That is what I grew up with, that is my first language. I learned to speak outside English at school, but at home, my family's from Mississippi and Arkansas, and our lexicon is a little different. And so I'll, I'll be having conversations with other people who speak AKBE, and we will find ourselves then having these conversations with people outside our communities who are saying, well, that's this, that's that. Well, no, it doesn't mean the same thing in here that it means out there. So in order for us to say that we have a single language, I feel like it takes us back to the danger of a single story, because the ways in which we talk about things, you know, one of the things that you'll often see when people say, oh, well, you know, black people are, are more homophobic than whatever, it, I, it's always interesting to me because the interpretation is one of, well, you're religious, so you don't like gay people. I'm like, have you been to a black church? Have you met our choir directors? <laughs> <laughs> I've got some news for you. <laughs> but it's not like that's, that's a unique thing. So it's very difficult to say that we can do this in a single language, because whose language? Right? We haven't achieved a, 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 a polyglot, patois, sort of an understanding of America, or anywhere else, period, much less for specifically social justice and job. I want to second that, because as someone who's worked as a translator for over a decade, there's no doubt in my mind that language is the single most important lens in which we interpret the world. No language, no world. It's as simple as that in some ways. There's sensation, but the sensation is not understanding, right? Um, and I think, yeah, we definitely need to ensure, you know, polyvocality, right? Because the awesome thing about lots and lots of language is the necessity of translation, and translation is the creation of new meaning. And I'm all over that. New <laughs> meaning's good, fewer meanings bad. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go on the record with this, right? <laughs> More meanings good, fewer meanings bad. Okay? <laughs> like, <laughs> And then English when I was five, so it really isn't a second language to me in a sense. 
But uh, uh, but when I was, was growing up in these two languages, uh, you know, I was very conscious. I was not very conscious in the beginning about the colonialist aspect of it. Uh, but later on, I realized that as I learned more and more English, I would read books that were well above my age, and I would figure out idioms. Now, it's one thing to understand the language and have a good grounding in it, but to understand idioms is to also understand culture. And I would figure out idioms and difficult words by context. It was hard work, but it was fun. That's how I learned the language really more than in, in the schools. And it occurred to me that what this reviewer was expecting was that these weird foreigners, you know, if they're going to write about their lands and cultures and so on, then they better explain everything to us and give it to us on a platter. Well, why the heck shouldn't he do the hard work of trying to figure stuff out from context? It's good for him too. Um, so, so that's one thing. And then, um, you know, the other thing I'm thinking of is, um, you know, we were talking about authenticity a little while ago. And uh, we also mentioned translation is an art of, of, in, of uh, constructing meaning. And I wonder if there's an analogy there, because, um, because uh, you know, it's to me, when, when I'm writing about or reading about a culture that's not mainstream culture in this country, um, then to me, it's not so much about authenticity as getting a certain kind of emphasis right so for instance, uh, that's the difference I note between white Western writers who write about India versus an Indian writer writing about India, although there are many different kinds of Indian writers. But uh, let's say about me writing about India then. Um, so for instance, a white writer might do his or her research and get all the facts right. But the things they will choose to emphasize or bring out about the culture will be entirely different from what I might choose to bring out. And so in a way, I wonder if there's a kind of analogy with you know, translation. I think it's a great where, point. Yeah. I really agree with you. Translation is fraught, right? I mean, it's important. It's absolutely important. There is no knowledge of authority without some form of translation, whether it's linguistic or cultural or whatever. You've got to speak to a different audience, right? Um, but the category or the notion of authenticity is troubling to me. Because first of all, it's based on a hierarchy, an implied hierarchy in some ways. The insider versus the outsider. And whether, you know, any hierarchy like that bothers me on a philosophical level. I get it that sometimes cultures need to protect themselves, I get all of that. But there needs to be porousness in our understanding of this notion. And I also don't like to put chains on the imagination either, right? It's okay for people to write about people who aren't like them, as long as they do their homework and they're sensitive and they, and they acknowledge a certain culpability and that I may get something wrong here, but I'm presenting a particular kind of vision to you. And as long as it's not colonializing, right? Not an imposition of a foreign meaning onto something, rather an interpretation of a foreign meaning, that's okay. But you've got to be, you've got to be upfront about that, and you've got to admit the possibility of error. And in, and in fact, error, some of my favorite texts incorporate the possibility of error as part of their form. And that's great, you know? The unreliable narrator, the, the, the naive narrator, creates an interesting text and opens a discussion rather than somebody trying to write an authoritative version of something that's for it. That's where the problem begins. And I think that's part of this. A good translator is sensitive to that, right? Uh, and because the languages and cultural codes are flexible so much. Like, I can't begin to explain to you why, I mean, I could give you a five second version, why every swear word in Quebec French is ecclesiastical is related to the dogma and ritual of the Catholic Church. You know, all the dirtiest words in Quebec French derive from that. That's a very specific cultural thing that, you know, when I've seen translators try to do this work, just, you know, not translate tabernacle as fuck, which is the right translation. It's not translated as tabernacle, yeah. right? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, but, you know, part of, it's part of, of course, language itself is hierarchical, yeah. right? So, but, and part of that hierarchy is that we don't hear certain voices. I mean, I think that's, that's partially what, what that review was about. There, is, there are no black gay men because we don't hear them. And, right. and when we do hear them, we don't, we don't want to acknowledge them. I can remember at the University of Manchester,
Massachusetts many years ago when um, a young woman said to me, a young graduate student said to me something about, well, I didn't even know black men could be gay. That went into the next novel. <laughs>
and thus, yeah, my family was running numbers and turning to bikes, all kinds of stuff. And that is really what has happened to a lot of people in these narratives is that the low end is sort of, and this takes us to class, the low end is sort of obscured because we either go really high or we go to these marginalized, really low folks who for some reason can teach the hero to do the thing, right. can't do the thing itself. Right. But we don't ever talk about the folks who just choose to step outside. Yeah, that to me, that's interesting. To me, that to me is not even, I mean, certainly it's an issue of representation, but far more than that, it's actually a, an issue of access, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just that those voices aren't being represented, but that they can be, because certain kinds of access are closed. And I think that does, as you say, have a lot to do with class, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. important one. Right? Well, and also when we talk about this, giving voice and voices, mm -hmm. if you're not being trusted with the story, you're not speaking on anyone's behalf. You've already chosen to say that you cannot be trusted. Because how many of us come from family backgrounds? And I, I know a few of us on this panel have had this conversation before, where your people don't tell these stories to outsiders. There are some things that are only for insiders. There are some things that remain within the community because those people are what we did in the first place, and it's not for them. Well, but it does go back to representation. I'm thinking specifically, for example, of uh, the genocide in Guatemala, which I, I, I tend to write about a lot. And, um, and really, um, you know, a lot of people have been very proactive about, you know, speaking on behalf of, of for example, the she women who, um, who this past summer were witness at the genocide trial. But the thing is, how many of them actually sit there and went through the, the, the witness, listened to them witnessing, realized that they've been fighting to have this moment um, where they can tell their story for 30 years. So, you know, there's this, there's this thing where we make people, we re-victimize people by giving them you know, even less agency than maybe the repressive government who, who, who you know, was architect of the genocide in the first place. Um, you know, we're getting close to the point where um, we should open it up to you all. So, so you have some questions, go back. Oh, we'll start here. Um, I don't actually have a question, but last week I heard um, Veronica Roth talk to almost a thousand people in Framing in Massachusetts about her Divergent series, which um, I don't know if anybody on the panel has read any of that. It, it, um, if you have, I'd be interested in, in your opinion. It seems to talk about people being assigned to categories and trying to break out of the limitations of being in those categories, and it was very, very popular. It's um, you know a young adult book. And the audience was mostly, you know, in Framingham, the audience was mostly, uh, you know, like one white mother and two or three white teenage girls. Have and any of you read it? I saw the movie. You know. <laughs> <laughs> what was your thinking about it? Um, as a movie, I mean, it was a movie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm not sure if the movie follows the novel at all, but I do know that um, one of the one of the main problems in a lot of these stories is when we start talking about um, the hunger grades in a lot of ways and this, when we start talking about these stories, all of a sudden race disappears. Um, gender becomes really important sometimes, but race disappears. You know, as if somehow we're going to, in the future, we're going to solve this problem. The way we're going to solve this problem is we're just going to eliminate all of those. And that becomes, you know, that becomes the absolute focus because once we can eliminate that, we can talk about the real issues, the real issues being us white people. You know, I'll tell you another aspect of this, and it bothered me about Hunger Games, and I mentioned this at, at, at last Hunger Con, and people had a fit with me. And now I'm going to take off my Latina hat and put on my old lady hat. I'll tell you, what the hell are these futures without any, any elders? You know, this isn't part of my culture. I don't think it's part of any culture that is sitting on with this diet. because lately all the covers have a white girl's face like right here. Right? <laughs> yeah, like it's like the side of her face and she's staring at you. I'm not really sure what's going on there. But when you get into these books, often they are retellings of actual 
oppressive regimes, except now all the victims are white. And often the perpetrators are white, and we've got this, you know, this stray brown or black person running through, because I don't know how many of you were paying attention when Hunger Games, the first Hunger Games movie first aired, but there were people who were outraged, upset. I really, I thought Rue was white. I, now I find out she's just some black girl. I thought she was innocent, but she's a black girl. And I've had this conversation a few times. She was um, called all kinds of names. Yes. I mean, she, the, the girl's like 12, and she was and really degraded, you know, because she was black, and no one could sympathize with this character any longer, because in their heads, she was white. And at the point, she, now mind you, they did not read the book, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> She was black. When I read the book, I knew she was fucking black. I don't understand how to she was black. Okay. But at the point that you figure it out, you still cannot come to terms with it. Right. I mean, one of the things is, speaking of an old lady and an old man, <laughs> uh, because I will, um, um, there, um, it's interesting. I, I was listening to um, the fact that, uh, yes, I will, uh, there, one. Texting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> texting. I'm not texting. I'm not texting. Uh, uh, My phone is buzzing away and I'm trying to turn it off. <laughs> um, at any rate, no, but one of the things I was, I was listening to you say um, about, uh, you know, I will never, I've never worked on my world's kitchen because of your mother, which is, I thoroughly understand. But one of the things that happens when you suddenly realize that you're on the other side of 70, uh, is you realize that you, the world has changed a lot under you. Um, I spent the first, you know, I spent the first 27 years of my life before Stonewall. You know, not the first five years, the first 27 years of my life. Um, have you ever walked into a restaurant in the South and as you got up to it, saw the sign and said, colored, colored this way? And you know, and, and, and gone into it? No. Okay. I, I, was, I, was, I was born that after seven yeah, yeah, years. I, I had you know, I, 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 that's been part of my life. I wouldn't do it today if I, I found it. But the point is that there are all sorts of things that you, in 10 or 15 or 20 years, you're going to be thinking about something that you wouldn't do that time, almost with the same vehemence You know, and because that's the way the world works. You know, you and, and we, we negotiate those things as best we can. You know, and sometimes we find yourself doing all sorts of things you wouldn't think. You know, um, I you know I can remember you know going into a, a, a you know I, I, a lot of my life is before Roe versus Wade, and I can remember coming uh, into a hospital and discovering that a young woman that I knew very well, just talking to an artist, had hung herself the previous night because she couldn't get an abortion legal. You know, and you know, a, a, somebody, a friend of mine, was dead because of the abortion laws. And I see us sliding back to that. And I don't think people realize the nightmare uh, from which we are sliding towards because they don't remember what it was like before that time. And that wasn't something that happened to me once, finding out someone had killed themselves. It happened to me twice that the people that I knew, and of course the number of times I've heard about it, are, are infinite. I, uh, I, I experienced much the same thing yeah. uh, when the Patriot Act. Yes, yeah. Right. I was like, whoa, whoa, don't we all know? I, I, I've lived without civil liberties. Right. So, I mean, what are we doing? So let's see. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up was to do with black and gayness again, which is, because that's awesome. Um, the movie Paris is Burning, which is a documentary um, with black, um, black gay ballrooms mm -hmm. and drag. And so the language used in that is super specific. And a lot of it is about you know how to talk to other black gay people safely and how to convey like, so are you? Uh, are you in that? And the documentarian 
took all the words, took the language, and gave none of the money to the people she filmed. So they are all poor, they have no fucking money, and then they're like, wait, you made all this money off us? And now, let's say 20 years later, a lot of the language that came from that movie has been, the blackness has been erased, the specificity has been erased, and now it's like, oh yeah, that's just gay language. I'm like, no. So but the Sister Sisters had a song, Let's Have a Kiki, which basically is word salad of black gay slang. It doesn't actually make any sense, but it was super popular because people were like, oh, gay things. I don't know. Um, anyway, I, I think we ran out of time. I hate to 